political documentaries from conservatives don't often make a huge splash. While movies such as Bowling for Columbine and An Inconvenient Truth won Academy Awards, movies such as Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, and 2016, Obama's America, didn't quite capture the attention of the film community. Looking at 2016 Obama's America specifically, according to its director, Dinesh D'Souza, it was meant to have an impact on the 2012 election. Of course, that didn't really happen. Or at least, it didn't have enough of an impact to prevent Obama's victory. But did you know that 2016 Obama's America grossed $33.4 million at the box office? That might not sound like much compared to a superhero movie, but its budget was a mere $2.5 million, netting it a very nice profit. And while most movies like these don't make quite that much, it does reveal a niche market exists for conservative documentaries. I thought it'd be interesting to delve into a couple of these to see what sorts of claims they make, what it is they're trying to do, and how they fit into the wider conservative media landscape. So I'll be looking at Dinesh D'Souza's most recent effort, the 2022 movie 2000 Mules, the 2022 Stu Peters movie Died Suddenly, and the 2019 movie No Safe Spaces starring Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla. 2000 Mules is the story of how the 2020 presidential election was supposedly stolen by Joe Biden and the Democrats. Where the movie gets its title is from the theory that there were 2,000 people involved in an elaborate ballot-stuffing campaign in five different swing states, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Wisconsin. By visiting various drop-off boxes, these 2,000 people added thousands of votes that would ultimately turn the election in Joe Biden's favor. Odds are pretty good that you already have an opinion on whether or not this is true. It's not exactly a new claim that's being explored here, and while the specifics may be different, the idea that the 2020 election was illegitimate was a meme more than a year before this movie came out. It was literally the inspiration for January 6th. So the movie feels a little late to the party right from the get-go. But the reason I want to talk about this movie first is because of one small section of 2000 Mules near the beginning. This is a clip where Dinesh D'Souza is discussing voter fraud with some right-wing talking heads. Is it not conceivable that Trump could have lost fair and square? I think millions of Americans know something went wrong and they have little pieces and no one's really put it together. They know that there was injustice. They know it in their gut. That's not how someone should know something. It's not a feeling in your gut or a conclusion drawn from cherry-picked evidence. But what this movie is doing is filling that void. It's being that bridge of evidence bringing people from suspicion to truth. But what is the actual evidence they bring forward? Let's go through what this movie presents. A group called True the Vote obtained anonymous cell phone geographic tracking data for millions of people in the various swing states. Apparently this is just a thing you can buy and is often purchased by companies looking to collect data for advertising and other nefarious purposes. Using this data, they identified a series of individuals who, ahead of the election, were tracked going to multiple NGOs and Dropbox locations. It's assumed by the investigators that at the NGOs, these people are picking up ballots and then going to the Dropboxes to deposit said ballots in small chunks of four to six ballots. Based on surveillance footage of some of these locations, these people are supposedly identified carrying multiple ballots and depositing small batches of them at each Dropbox. These ballots may or may not have been fraudulent. Some math is shown on screen to show how this operation created just enough voter fraud to tip the election from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. Now, on the face of it, this evidence isn't the worst I've seen, but with a minimal amount of critical thinking, a number of glaring holes start popping up in this scenario. Let's go through a couple of them. We identified in Atlanta 242 people that went to an average of 24 drop boxes in eight organizations during a two-week period. First, and this should be emphasized, Tracking someone's location doesn't tell you anything about what a person is doing at said location. There are a number of people whose jobs take them all over the city over a two-week period. Delivery people, cab drivers, and more travel around the city and could conceivably pass by these drop boxes. Heck, the people who drive around picking up early ballots and any monitors or police traveling with them would also be counted in this process too. Speaking with the Associated Press, Aaron Striegel, a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Notre Dame, said, You could use cellular evidence to say this person was in that area, but to say they were at the ballot box, you're stretching it a lot. There's always a pretty healthy amount of uncertainty that comes with this. Second, consider that these drop boxes aren't hidden in obscure corners of the city, but rather prime locations that already get a ton of foot traffic. It's not unusual to imagine that 242 people travel to the same 10 popular locations within a city when we're talking about a population of nearly 500,000 people. 
The researchers assure us that they've taken certain measures into place, but the only ones they really rule out are individuals who have fixed daily patterns like mail carriers. It doesn't account for irregular actors who may travel around a city for a variety of reasons, like the aforementioned cab drivers or delivery people who may not have a specific fixed route they're going on every single day. The surveillance footage is supposedly what will tell us what these people are actually doing at each Dropbox location, although the investigators tell us up front that they could only get footage for a handful of locations. And when they show us examples of the evidence of these supposed ballot stuffers, it gets even less convincing. Here's an example of how the movie tries to stretch the truth. Approximately one o'clock in the morning on January the 5th. Stuffs are ballots in there. It's like a small stackish, maybe three, maybe four. Takes them off and then puts them in a trash can that she never looked at. So she knew it was there. She knew it was there, right? First off, zooming in on the footage here, how does this look like three or four ballots? I genuinely don't know where that estimate comes from because it just looks like one to me. Also, her knowing where the garbage can is, is maybe the least convincing thing I've ever heard. Maybe she was turning a corner while approaching the box and saw it on the way, or maybe she's been to this part of town before. Knowing where a trash can is, isn't evidence of voter fraud. Approximately one o'clock in the morning on January the 5th. Yeah, this footage isn't even from the presidential election. This is from the Georgia runoff that happened over a month later. While we're told she's been to dozens of other drop boxes, this is the only footage we see of this woman. We don't even see her dropping off ballots during the 2020 election. We see other examples of people dropping off multiple ballots, though we only ever see these people visiting one location. We're told these people are going to dozens of drop boxes, but we're never actually shown footage to demonstrate that. We're just told to take their word for it, that these are trustworthy investigators who definitely have the data to back up everything they're saying. What they don't really mention is that in some states, it's completely legal to drop off multiple ballots. Some states only allow family members to do it, but in other states, a voter can give anyone permission to drop off their ballots. What would have been more convincing is if this movie had shown one person visiting multiple locations or coming back to the same location multiple times. There isn't a single example like that. And even if they could produce something that compelling, they would still have a lot of work ahead of them trying to figure out who this person is and whether or not they have permission to be dropping off these ballots. At no point is an effort like that ever made in this movie. We're given just enough evidence to raise a question, but there's never any follow through to more fully investigate the claim. It's the bare minimum of evidence of anything happening at all, and nothing that comes close to presenting conclusive or definitive proof. Although, at one point, they do try to connect it to Antifa. There were several different violent BLM Antifa riots in Atlanta. In one of them, we had three dozen of our mules participate in these violent riots. A reporter from NPR investigated this particular claim. Yeah, D'Souza has also claimed that True the Vote found a bunch of these supposed ballot traffickers were Antifa rioters by supposedly cross-referencing their data with a group that monitors devices at violent protests. The group they cite told me that's impossible. They don't monitor cell phones at all. Similarly, they also misrepresent how they did their research using supercomputers. Greg Phillips of True the Vote separately has also claimed that he did some of the work on this analysis at a high-powered computing center at Mississippi State University. The university, that's false. Said Phillips leased space in a separate building near the computing center. He once took a tour of the supercomputers, but he did not work in the computing center. True the Vote acknowledged to me that they got the building wrong. And there are also claims from the investigators that their research was used to find a murder suspect. And we turned the bulk of this information over to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, I read, they've arrested two suspects. They have. According to Nellie Miles, the GBI's director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, speaking to NPR, they said, The GBI did not receive information from True the Vote that connected to the Securia Turner investigation. According to the investigators, they contacted the FBI roughly on October 25th, 2021, except two people were indicted for the crime on August 13th, 2021, two months earlier. If the True the Vote crew had any role in this case, they're very much overstating it if they're saying they had anything to do with the arrest, and the impact of their research is being grossly overstated. Generally speaking, True the Vote doesn't seem to have the best track record on being open and honest with their descriptions of what they do, how they do it, and what they found. It does raise the question as whether or not they can be trusted as a source for any of these claims of voter fraud. We get a few other small pieces of evidence, like when Evil Sarah Zed, or I guess Sarah Z, 
interviews a supposed whistleblower, but his observations are much more than seeing people dropping off multiple ballots, which is completely legal. More interesting is the second whistleblower from San Luis, Arizona, which apparently reveals a ballot harvesting scheme. Now, there was a ballot harvesting scheme in a municipal election back in 2020. Two people were charged for forging four ballots. Importantly here, the 2000 Mules researchers weren't even looking into data for this small town. They were tracking people in Phoenix. The Attorney General's office in Arizona even approached True the Vote for this data regarding illegal vote harvesting, but the researchers declined to hand any over. In Georgia, though, when True the Vote did hand over data, the state, which is controlled by Republicans, didn't find it convincing enough to mount an investigation. The only case of voter fraud presented, aside from vaguely alluding to the San Luis case, involves McCray Dowless, who committed ballot fraud in North Carolina for the Republican Party in 2018. This is a case we know about, by the way, because of a thorough investigation that evidenced how Dowless acted, including the names and testimony of his accomplices. They didn't just look at cell phone data and some grainy surveillance footage and call it a day. This case, much like the San Luis case, one are both publicly known attempts to cheat an election that involved less than five people. It makes you wonder how a conspiracy that involves thousands of people somehow can't find any better evidence than some inconclusive cell phone data and surveillance footage. And that's about it for most of the evidence. I've included links to various outlets, which touch on a few other claims I haven't mentioned here, and informed a lot of the conclusions I've outlined. 2000 Mules does a good job of making the audience go, huh, but never digs deep enough to provide genuinely compelling evidence of voter fraud. It's hard to imagine a neutral party being convinced by this thing, but that's not really the point of this movie. One of the weirder aspects of it is how it revises the events of January 6th, peppering small talking points throughout the movie about how the rioters were justified or that the FBI had some nefarious reasons for arresting hundreds of people for illegal entering the Capitol building to overturn an election. It wasn't an insurrection, it was a primal scream. It speaks kindly about those people because they are who this movie is for. People who have a specific conclusion in mind and are looking for evidence, no matter how flimsy it is, to support that conclusion. I want to go back to that Charlie Kirk clip for a second. I think millions of Americans know something went wrong and they have little pieces and no one's really put it together. They know that there was injustice. They know it in their gut. And that really captures everything. This is a movie for people who already know, not for people who will bring skepticism to the evidence being presented, which is why it's so convincing to one audience and so unconvincing to others. And it also reveals how this movie is more propaganda than documentary. Consider some very basic assumptions here. How is it that the Democrats knew how many mules they would need to overturn the election? How did they know how many votes Trump would get? And why did the Democrats keep it so close? And how did the filmmakers know that every single one of these drop-off votes would go to Biden? Mail-in votes favored the Democrats, but they weren't 100% for Biden. It basically supposes that these ballots are all being forged in addition to being stuffed, although it doesn't even try to demonstrate how that's happening. It just makes vague allusions to residents from nursing home needing some extra help either filling out or dropping off their ballots. The movie also clearly has some money behind it as we're treated to these ridiculous sets with dramatic lighting and fancy graphics, as if this isn't obviously staged. There are also these dramatic recreations of people sneaking ballots into boxes and all sorts of other flashy techniques to create the impression of a well-produced documentary. Had they been more interested in finding out the real facts of the matter, they would have put some of that money into hiring more investigators to look into these claims and providing a more robust amount of evidence. But this is more about selling the sizzle and not the steak of voter fraud claims. 2000 Mules only made a mere $1.5 million at the box office, but it likely made a bit more money streaming online where people were charged $29.99 to watch it, although it was reduced to $19.99 a few days after it went live. You can also buy it on DVD now. The deluxe edition has chapter selects. Fancy. Writing for the Washington Post, Philip Bump summed it up well, saying, At its heart, 2000 Mules is a triumph of capitalism. There's a huge demand for proving that Trump didn't lose in 2020, and this film provides just enough of a veneer of authority to let people collapse comfortably into that belief. That it doesn't survive even mild external scrutiny is as relevant as pointing out contradictions in a religious text is to recent converts. They want to believe what they want to believe. So that's 2000 Mules, but let's move on to another one of these movies. Died Suddenly purports to explore the supposed increase of people suddenly dying, suggesting that these deaths are a result of the COVID-19 vaccines. 
Like 2000 Mules, Died Suddenly is likely not to win any converts, but let's go over some of the claims made in this one. The movie argues that there is an increase in reports of people suddenly dying, and that this is connected to a supposed increase in the number of blood clots being found in corpses by embalmers. The blood clot plot is supplemented by another theory that this is being engineered by a group of global elites trying to depopulate the Earth. The whole danger is predicated on the idea that there is an unexplained increase in deaths, evidenced from comments from an insurance company, One America, which states that all causes of death are up among 18 to 49 year olds, not counting deaths due to COVID-19. U.S. life insurance companies have reported an overwhelming and unexplainable increase in all-cause deaths among 18 to 49 year olds. We run into our first problem right here. While the numbers are accurate, it's a very selective reading of the comments coming from insurance companies. Comments from other insurers elaborate on the situation, such as one from Global Life Finance Chief Frank Svoboda. He said on a conference call, The losses we are seeing continue to be elevated over 2019 levels due, at least in part, we believe, to the pandemic and the existence of either delayed or unavailable health care. Other insurers describe that a system burdened by COVID patients and a general fear of infection from hospitals is keeping people away from seeking medical care, which is what's leading to the increased number of deaths. Also note that the movie is claiming blood clots are killing more people when the original quote was that the death rate is up for all causes of death. Blood clots can be associated with a number of different causes of death, but not all of them. Why are we talking about this? The title of the movie is Died Suddenly, not Died at the Hospital Waiting for Treatment or Died at Home Because They Were Afraid to Go to the Doctor. But this is the evidence that the movie provides. They brought up the comments that came from insurance companies reporting higher death rates, but then they ignored the comments from those same insurance companies that contradict that narrative. And why did they go to insurance companies when they could have just found the exact same data from the CDC? In fact, looking at comments from One America themselves, in another news story, they elaborated that their estimates are consistent with the CDC data. I suspect the reason it doesn't get mentioned is because the mission of this movie is to undermine public health policy and create general distrust of the government. If they were using the numbers that came from the CDC, it would be a lot harder for them to make that claim. It's why the opening credits of this movie include random shots of Lee Harvey Oswald, the moon landing, and even Bigfoot. It's doing a speed run of every fringe figure it can do to signify to the audience what kind of movie this is. And then we get this section where Tom Hanks is supposedly being used to push Malthusianism, which is the idea that the Earth's resources can't support the population and therefore, according to this movie, a mass culling is on its way, engineered by the global elites. There could be too many people on the planet Earth, and actually the math does add up. Just give us a 20-second definition of Malthusian theory, which there is amazing. Go. Well, right. that's, that's what I'm built for. Do I even need to explain that Tom Hanks was only there to promote a movie? It was 2016's Inferno, if you're curious. I haven't seen it, but it looks like it was probably bad. It's one of the many clips that are shown that make vague references to Malthusianism to supposedly prove that it's a thing that the powers that be want to happen. Apparently, they signify this by having Tom Hanks talk about it on a TV show. I don't think a few random clips is evidence of a global plot to kill off a huge portion of the Earth's population. This movie is not about that specific idea, though, but it's one you have to believe in order for all of this to make sense. For the time being, let's put aside this though so we can focus on the main argument of the movie. The centerpiece for the claim that people are suddenly dying comes from embalmers who have reported finding long fibers within the veins of corpses, something that was supposedly relatively rare in the past but is now increasingly happening. I'm going to avoid showing any footage of the blood clots since YouTube probably wouldn't like that, but just know that the movie shows lots and lots of footage of them. It's all very gross and unpleasant. Because of its popularity online, most of the claims in this movie have already been addressed by doctors and scientists far more qualified than me. But here's a quick rundown of what this movie gets wrong. In a post online on the website of McGill University by Jonathan Jerry, who holds a master's degree in molecular biology, we get another explanation for the increased number of blood clots being reported. Clots can easily form after death, as the liquid and solid parts of blood separate, and as formaldehyde and calcium-containing water used in the embalming process catalyze clotting. Refrigeration can also be to blame, especially when a rapid influx of bodies due to COVID necessitates longer stays in the cooler as embalmers make their way through their backlog. Coupled with that, the embalmers aren't providing any sort of evidence as to how any of these people died, something they aren't trained to do as that's typically the job of a coroner. I don't know how they determine the vaccination status for any of these people, and we don't even have any real data that blood clot rates are up. Just a few anecdotes from this movie. 
And even assuming there is data to support this, it still doesn't mean the vaccine must be the cause. Going back to Jerry's post. The COVID-19 vaccines made by AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson were indeed associated with rare, and I must repeat rare, cases of blood clots. But risk factors for blood clots in general include obesity, cancer, a sedentary lifestyle, pregnancy, family history, and smoking. Oh, and COVID-19 itself, which you won't learn from diet suddenly. This may surprise you, but an American dies of a blood clot every six minutes. Clots, either before or after death, are common. One of the clots, which are weirdly kept in the embalmer's home instead of a lab, were sent for testing. No connection to COVID-19 was found. And there are so many other easily disproven claims in this movie. For example, they say there is no list of ingredients for the vaccine. And this should look the same as the other package insert that I showed you. But yet when we open it almost two years into this, we find that it still says intentionally blank. And it, I mean, they're, they're allowed to, under emergency authorization, put anything in them they want. You can find all the ingredients online and have been able to since 2020. Even the montage of people suddenly dying is nonsense. A Twitter thread from a user named The Real Truther finds the origins for many of the clips used. Several of the people shown not only haven't been vaccinated, some of them are very much alive. There's a great breakdown of all the things this movie gets wrong in a video by Debunk the Funk. I highly recommend it as Dr. Dan Wilson has a PhD in molecular biology and really goes to town debunking pretty much every claim this movie tries to make regarding the science. There are also some statements in this movie that are just on their face ridiculous. I have significant concerns that we won't have a standing army in five years. How can someone take that seriously? Millions of people would need to die suddenly you'd need a pretty powerful adversary to pull that off. These all started a long time ago. Some could say in biblical times with good and evil. If we think that there are not nefarious actors in the world, people that work for principalities and, and dark places, if we think that, we're fooling ourselves, right? Because that's where we're at. The devil here he eventually describes is actually Heinrich Kissinger. And if we're talking about the most evil person on the planet, you can make a pretty good case for Kissinger. But rather than sabotaging peace talks in Vietnam that led to the needless deaths of hundreds of thousands, what Kissinger is being blamed for here is inspiring a global depopulation program because of a paper he wrote in the 1970s. Now, I'm not saying Kissinger isn't willing to use mass murder as a tool for political success, because he obviously has, but I don't see his fingerprints on this one. And that's how off the wall this movie is. I'm even reduced to explaining that a monster like Henry Kissinger is actually not responsible for a gross atrocity. At least not this one. The endless complexity of this plan is really confusing too. The movie claims the virus was created in a lab so that people would then voluntarily take the vaccine. If that were the case, why take the extra step of introducing the vaccine at all? Why not just make a virus that kills off a portion of the population? The rest of this movie is a series of desperate stunts, bright lights designed to dazzle in something that is thoroughly unconvincing. Even the movie's title, Died Suddenly, has no real heft if you give it an ounce of critical attention. If you google the phrase, Died Suddenly, you'll definitely find news stories of people dying in the last few years. But you can do the same thing if you google the term using news stories from 10 years ago. It's a common phrase that's been used in journalism going back decades. Much like 2000 Mules, this is not a movie to convince someone completely foreign to the concept of being anti-vax, or at least anti-COVID vaccine. Reading the reviews online revealed many people saying things like, finally, the truth can be said, or other phrases that clearly reveal that they had made up their minds about this subject a while ago. They just needed someone to come along and provide the evidence to support that conclusion. What makes this a particularly fitting movie for that kind of evidence-seeking is that it also gives viewers the tools to keep pushing that idea that people are dying suddenly because of a vaccine. All it requires is the announcement of an unexpected death, and people will fill in the blanks regardless of whatever information eventually comes out. More than people making fools of themselves on Twitter, this has very real consequences when people's deaths, or sometimes supposed deaths, are being latched onto. An article in the Associated Press outlines a number of individuals featured in the movie, or family members of those who actually passed away, describing their experience being tied to this movie. A section from the article reads, California writer Dolores Cruz published an essay in 2022 about grieving for her son, who died in a car crash in 2017. Died suddenly used a screenshot of the headline in the film, portraying his death as vaccine-related. Without my permission, someone has taken his story to show one side, and I don't appreciate that, Cruz said in an interview. His legacy and memory are being tarnished. The article also describes how the death of a six-year-old girl, Anastasia Weaver, was co-opted by people using the died suddenly narrative. 
A prolific Twitter account posted Anastasia's name and smiling dance portrait in a tweet with a syringe emoji. A Facebook user messaged her mother, Jessica Day Weaver, to call her a murderer for having her child vaccinated. In reality, the Ohio kindergartner had experienced lifelong health problems since her premature birth, including epilepsy, asthma, and frequent hospitalizations with respiratory viruses. The doctors haven't given us any information other than it was due to all of her chronic conditions. There was never a thought that it could be from the vaccine, Dayweaver said of her daughter's death. Died suddenly doesn't have a price tag attached to it, but it has been viewed over 17 million times on Rumble. Before we go on, I'd like to talk about my sponsor for this video, Raycon. Personally, it took me a little while to warm up to the idea of using wireless earbuds, and a big part of that was the cost. Raycon's everyday earbuds are more affordable than most of the high-end brands out there, and still offers a decent sound quality. With the weather starting to get a bit warmer, I'm looking forward to using them when I go for a run around my neighborhood. Now, I'll probably have to use that awareness mode so I won't get hit by any cars, a plus when I'm running. They have a nice snug fit, so that should prevent me from having to catch a loose bud that pops out when I'm in mid-run, something I've had to worry about in the past. You can grab your own pair of everyday earbuds by clicking on the link in the description box or going to buyraycon.com forward slash Jose. If you use the link, you'll get 15% off. In addition to getting a cool new pair of earbuds, you'll also be supporting this channel, which is something I very much appreciate. Now let's get back to the video. As we've seen so far, these movies are for the converted, but the first two at the very least were based on things that actually happened. There was a 2020 election and there is a COVID vaccine, but how do these movies advance a narrative that's just smoke and mirrors? No Safe Spaces came out in 2019, starring Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla. It's about the supposed controversy of left-wing activists censoring speakers on college campuses, tracing all the way back to the previous decade. By the time this movie came out, the very concept of the free speech wars on college campuses was taken as an absolute fact on the right, so this movie should be considered less a fight against naysayers and rather a victory lap over something that was obviously true, at least in the mind of its audience. So it must have a lot of evidence for it, right? If you're familiar with this talking point and arguments put forth by the right, you won't be surprised to see a lot of the same stories being brought up here. We see Jordan Peterson talking about people being in prison for using the wrong pronouns, Brett Weinstein discussing how students at Evergreen College are trying to force white kids off of campus, and Lindsay Shepard's secret recording of administrators asking her to amend her teaching strategies. There are 4,360 higher education institutions in the United States of America. Each of these colleges invites dozens, if not hundreds, of guest speakers every year. The fact that this movie, several years after the whole campus free speech crisis narrative kicked into high gear, is still regurgitating the same old examples raises the question of how big a problem this really is, if at all. Even if you really believe that Jordan Peterson having to talk to some angry students one afternoon, and then becoming a millionaire with a massive platform, is somehow an example of censorship, how are there not dozens of other examples that fit this bill? Even if they don't become millionaires, surely there must be dozens upon dozens of professors just like him ready to speak out against students who are silencing them or preventing speakers from showing up on campus. One of the biggest predictors for any of these stories having permanence seems to be the willingness for the supposed victims to buy into the narrative and become a talking head in support of it. Throughout the movie, footage is dropped in of Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla speaking at a variety of venues. If you look at the poster of this movie, you would think they were facing stiff backlash and heated protests wherever they went, but the closest they got to being protested was in 2016, when one of their talks at the University of California Northridge was supposedly cancelled. According to Dennis Prager, this was because of the content of their discussion. They had it fully approved you and me being there. They then cancelled it because of the topic. According to the university, though, the reservation request Corolla and Prager were making couldn't be accommodated because of a lack of communication for their needs with regard to electronic setup and security. Corolla and Prager had appeared at the university in the past, and it's hard to imagine them suddenly having some volatile new thing they wanted to say that would have enraged students enough to cancel the event. Either way, it doesn't seem like the students were involved with this at all, as the administrators were the one who informed them they couldn't keep the reservation. I rode a bike everywhere, never with a helmet, because I was jumping and doing wheelies. I never hit my head once. Like, because I didn't have protection, it was all elbows and knees and rolling, and I actually learned how to fall. Putting aside the obviously ridiculous comparison to wearing a helmet, an objectively good thing, 
since when does wearing a helmet make someone stop trying to break their fall? Even if you're wearing one, it's still dangerous and not at all fun to hit your head on something. I know this guy is meant to be a comedian, but this was just an insultingly bad point. The closest we get to seeing these two actually engaged students is watching Dennis Prager struggle against a group of black students on a campus, asking them if they think America is essentially racist. I don't think anyone in America is oppressed. You do, obviously, and that's a very so big divide. After hundreds of years of slavery, after hundreds of you don't years think of we've been oppressed? No, 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 no. you didn't say oppressed? have been, you said are. You think blacks were once oppressed oh, of from course. slavery? It's, it's just so how do you not think that it's, it's generational? How do you right. not think that we're still trying to consciously yeah. socially because still recover from that. The students bring up some interesting points, and we don't see much in Prager's responses aside from him struggling to cram his very definition of racism into the conversation. These moments are interrupted by segments featuring Shelby Steele, a Robert J. and Marion E. Oster senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, breaking in to undermine anything these students say. At some point down the road, I don't know when, but at some point we as blacks are going to realize the degree to which we identified our aspiration in victimization. This is the caricature of debate that's presented in the movie and something that really annoyed me. In the moment, Prager couldn't bring his A-game, and I imagine he didn't think he'd have so much trouble confronting several college students at once, and he ended up coming off pretty bad. To then intercut that poor performance with footage of an opposing view of someone sitting comfy in a studio addressing these points is deeply unfair. The entire movie is about presenting the left as refusing to debate the right, and one of the rare times we see any sort of debate in this movie, the right-wing position is taken up by an experienced and credentialed speaker in a comfy chair in a studio making his point, while the left is represented by a few students standing outdoors talking to Dennis Prager, immediately pushing back against anything they say. This is not a forum for honest debate. This is a platform that's tilted heavily in favor of the right. Another thing that really annoyed me in this movie was early on when Dennis Prager said this. This is brand new. This is one of the few things one could say we have no precedent for in the United States. They identify the start date of free speech being under assault on college campuses as 2013 or 2014. I want to read an excerpt from an editorial. Frightening progress has been made toward radicalizing the campus. The movement has engulfed many of the most prestigious universities and is a recognized influence on almost every campus. Colleges have been shut down, files looted, manuscripts destroyed, and buildings burned. Freedom of speech has been denied, reason discourse repudiated, and academic freedom endangered. This was written in 1970 by soon-to-be Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell. This excerpt was highlighted in a 2019 article by Marianne Franks, a professor of law and the Michael R. Klein Distinguished Scholar Chair at the University of Miami School of Law. In her article, Professor Franks details how the free speech on campus crisis has largely been manufactured, and then used as a tool for silencing speech on campus. This often takes the shape of censorious free speech laws that limit how students are allowed to protest under the guise of protecting the speech of others. Students have been protesting on campuses for decades, and the right has been complaining about it for just as long. This article really aptly describes how contentious speech is not the same as censorious speech. Violence is unacceptable, of course, but it's also incredibly rare. What's more typically complained about in these movies is protest, or in other words, students exercising their free speech. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, or FIRE for short, is financed by various right-wing figures to track free speech on campuses. And even being particularly sensitive to this issue, their list of disinvited speakers is laughably small. There were supposedly 545 disinvited speakers over the last 25 years, and that's in a country with over 4,300 post-secondary schools. It also includes disinvitations from the left and the right. Even with that inflating the numbers, this just does not appear to be the major issue that this movie makes it out to be. What the campus free speech issue does highlight well, and this is embodied by the No Safe Spaces movie, is that one of the keys to making a narrative like this stick is to constantly repeat it, regardless of how thin the evidence is. Just keep saying the left is shutting down free speech on campus, and people will believe it's an epidemic, when it's just a few cherry-picked examples repeated over and over. It's how a movie like this gets made because the right-wing media ecosystem demands more content that echoes the narratives that already exist. Movies like these have been around for a while, and have very much been assimilated into the right-wing media space, even being very lucrative in some instances. One interesting historical example was highlighted by David Korn in his book, 
American Psychosis, a historical investigation of how the Republican Party went crazy. In it, he details how a narrative about the Clinton family was created by the right, that they were responsible for a series of deaths, notably sparked by the suicide of Vince Foster, an attorney working for the Clinton White House. Although no meaningful evidence has ever been provided that he was murdered by anyone, let alone the Clintons, it was enough to give life to the narrative. Here's an excerpt from Korn's book about a movie titled Bill and Hillary Clinton's Circle of Power, promoted by right-wing religious leader Jerry Falwell. The video asserted that Foster and Hillary Clinton were having an affair and that Foster did not kill himself. Larry Nichols alleged in the film that Bill Clinton had connections to a drug smuggling operation run out of an airfield in Mena, Arkansas. The video included Bill Denemeyer, a former far-right Republican congressman, denouncing Clinton as a draft-dodging womanizer who is a pathological liar, and calling for his impeachment. The film ended with Jerry Falwell questioning Foster's suicide and pitching copies of the video for $40. He asked viewers to call a 900 telephone number to join him in demanding a congressional investigation of murder, witness intimidation, and the subsequent cover-up of Whitewater facts. The cost of the call? $1.95 a minute. None of these claims hold any water and are advanced by longtime right-wing operatives like Cherry Falwell, who famously said 9-11 was caused by gay people and abortions. But notable here is that the movie shifted 150,000 units, earning Falwell millions of dollars, and was all built on spreading a bogus narrative. I've been avoiding the term conspiracy theory in this video as it's a term that often shuts down discourse. Not because it doesn't mean anything, but because it's a term that creates a definitive impression in people's minds of what any of these movies are. Looking at the academic literature on the subject, a lot of it is trying to untangle the popular association of conspiracy theories to try and place them into a more understandable context of a phenomenon in society free of emotionally charged labels. Two of the movies I've highlighted, 2000 Mules and Died Suddenly, fit very nicely under the label conspiracy theory. No Safe Spaces is more of a bogus news story but does similarly present an imagined threat. The reason these movies are spread, and why I label them conservative, is because they are cynically used as tools by political parties. Well, in this case, one political party specifically. 2000 Mules was created with an obvious political purpose, to undermine confidence in the 2020 election, something that has been adopted by many members of the Republican Party. We can see Donald Trump himself promoting it. Died Suddenly is similarly given credibility by elected officials such as Marjorie Taylor Greene. And No Safe Spaces and the narratives around college campus hostility to the right has inspired anti-protest legislation being used by right-wing politicians. While these movies are ridiculous on their face and easy enough to mock, it's important to acknowledge the role they play as political tools, providing fodder to fuel voters to support a political party. Not everyone who believes in one of these narratives necessarily believes in all of them, or at least spreads all of them. But in an interesting way, the overlap in political purpose reveals how commerce and politics have supercharged this whole process and made movies like this one piece of a much larger problem. Whether it's Jerry Falwell and his Clinton movie or Dinesh D'Souza and his voter fraud movie, there are always people producing shoddy evidence to cash in on propagating bogus political narratives for money. The opening of Died Suddenly in some ways captures this very weird singularity happening here. All these random shots of different conspiracy theories, some contradicting others, but most importantly, signifying to the audience that there are stories that they are being lied to about, and that this movie is going to reveal a hidden truth. Before making Diet Suddenly, Stu Peters produced a less popular movie, Watch the Water, which is about how COVID-19 is snake venom making people hybrids of Satan. I think this is the plan all along, was to get the serpents, the evil ones, DNA into your God created DNA. Was this all a plot to make everyone a demon? Or is this a plot to depopulate the world? Maybe in the mind of Peters, it's all consistent somehow, but it hardly paints a coherent and consistent worldview, outside of the vague notion that dark forces are trying to corrupt the world. Michael Butter, in his book, The Nature of Conspiracy Theories, explains how tying one's financial success to spreading these conspiracy theories forces the continued need to innovate those theories, often commenting on news stories of the day. That is, to continuously spin current events into an existing conspiracy framework, starting with the conclusion and working backwards from there. There are always new facts to uncover, but the truth or conclusion of those facts is never in doubt. Figures like Alex Jones and David Icke have been doing this for decades, regardless of how nonsensical their worldviews are, often making predictions that never come true and supposedly having documents that are never actually produced. What matters most is to continuously produce content and merchandise and other items that can earn them money. 
all supporting a worldview steeped in increasingly vague notions of an elite ruling class having conspired behind the scenes of every major, and not so major, news story of the day. And pumping out poorly researched documentaries can be a very effective way of making money, especially when you've got a political party and right-wing media environment ready to give it credence. This also reflects how one of the predictors as to whether or not someone will believe in a conspiracy theory is if they already believe in another one. By tying a political identity to a conspiracy theory, it opens the door for even more people to become attached to it, and a vicious cycle is formed as people dig deeper into them, a cycle that is easily exploited by anyone selling a movie to add a new theory or supplement an existing one. These movies shouldn't be seen as anything more than products filling a need. They aren't genuine investigations into anything, just competent enough productions that are sold at an inflated price to further support a bogus narrative that is pushed by those looking to exploit the people who believe in it. One of the most frustrating parts about all this is how once people are sucked into this ecosystem, it's very tough to get them out. But what I'm trying to highlight is that it's more than just distrust or fear that keeps people trapped. There are political and economic systems working to create the environment for movies like these, exploiting people's fear for profit and political gain. While it's exceptionally difficult to break someone free of the spell of movies like these, hopefully a video like this one will provide protection for anyone who might fall into the trap of one of these odious movies in the future. If it seems like it's part of some kind of conspiracy ecosystem, it's because it is. And if it seems like it's being pushed by a political party for an agenda, that's because it's true too. These aren't tools that will free your mind, they'll keep you ignorant while making some horrible people even more rich. Originally this video was actually going to touch on a different movie instead of No Safe Spaces. I was going to talk about a recent Candace Owens movie, The Greatest Lie Ever Told, about George Floyd and the BLM protests. Turns out that movie is really boring and uninteresting. It's also kind of sad and pathetic. I, it just didn't seem like a good fit as it didn't really compare to the other two movies nicely because it's about trying to prove a thing doesn't exist. That is racial discrimination against black communities by the police. And maybe that'll be a video in the future. Not just that, but several other movies that are all about trying to undermine popular narratives within mainstream circles. If you'd like to see a movie like that, or maybe you have some other ideas, you can always drop me a message. But the messages I always listen to most closely are the ones from my patrons. You see their names now going up the screen. I want to thank all of them for helping support this work. If you would like to join these lovely people, you can join my Patreon and get early access to my videos. You also get a few little fun extras along the way, plus your name in the credits, and just a warm fuzzy feeling that you helped me make some videos. If you'd like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and share this video with anyone or any social media feed you think might be interested in it. Thank you all so much for watching.